Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is another exclusive story from the incredible mind of our good friend Rico Stories, exclusive to the DMT Fries to Fear channel. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story and title. Project Achilles. Let's get straight into that. Prologue. And the Watchers taught men to wage war. Part 1. The first shall be the last. It was 2002 and the war on terror was ramping up. The sounds of the heavy excavators and monster dump trucks shook the ground for up to a mile away as the temperatures soared above 100 degrees. The Tigris and Euphrates were low due to a drought and there might never be a better time than now to locate the ancient tombs alleged to be under the waters. As much of Iraq was shut down after the invasion, the digging and grading continued with crews and equipment brought in from other countries to supplement the indigenous workforce. And as the excavation went deeper into this area of myth, legend and prophecy, the locals became more anxious, and many walked off the job in fear. On that day the machines breached a gigantic slab of stone, a chilling rush of air was felt to come up and out of the earth. The remaining locals ran in terror, while many others felt tired or uneasy and filled with dread. An archaeologist screamed, Down here, Mr. Drake, down here! And Drake called out, Roll past the area and bring in the team. Men in hazmat suits with biological gear gathered to see a sight not seen since the Old Testament times or before. Part 2. End or Beginning Several years had passed since Chuck and I had our first cryptid experiences. Joint Task Force Chimera, JTC, had become a very effective program. But our funding had been steadily cut and funneled into some top secret program. Our numbers dwindled down to only 15 people assigned to cover the entire country. And Tommy Wolf was now in charge of the Department of Interior's Cryptid Monitoring program. His group tagged and tracked cryptids to study and record their movements and whereabouts. My old friend Tim Ross was now Interpol's Cryptid Unit Director. We were fortunate though to have two C-130s assigned to us as our forward operating bases, along with a support crew to maintain our equipment. Our neuro-enhanced drones were armed with 40mm grenade launchers and able to maintain overwatch for up to 12 hours. Akimi and I now had two children, and I had made Lieutenant Colonel. Chuck was now Command Sergeant Major and had two kids also. Raymond Drake had completely vanished. Reported sightings of strange huge men had trickled in from various forests. They were dressed in all black and in some cases were accompanied by huge dogs. Now, Kimi had called me to say that she had managed to pull up some non-public reports alleging that slaughtered dogmen, Sasquatch and even reptilians had been discovered in remote areas. And she was sending me the reports and suggested that Chuck and I read them. A Kentucky eyewitness saw a large wolf cross the road in front of her car, being chased by a huge dog, followed by what she described as a huge basketball player dressed in all black that must have been seven feet tall. She swore that when he looked in her direction, his eyes shined a bright blue. A Wyoming hunter in a tree stand just before daylight saw what looked like a Sasquatch, but bigger and with a snout full of razor teeth stumbling through the woods falling and getting up with an oversized arrow in its back. A giant dog suddenly appeared and blocked its path, and as it hesitated to look at the dog, a huge arrow ripped through its back and stuck through the front of its chest, and it fell to the ground. And all he remembered after that was a bright blinding light, followed by an ear-piercing sound. And when he awoke, there was no sign of the creature that was later believed to be a gugwe. Campus near the Okefenokee Swamp awoke about 0200 on a moonlit night to a loud screech and saw what they described as a man with lizard-like features running and trying to fight off 
a huge dog. And suddenly, a huge NFL lineman with a big sword emerged from the trees and decapitated the lizard. And they heard a dizzy and high-pitched sound, and the next day remember, it was daylight, and they were waking up inside of their tents. And then there were two more serious reports. A group of a dozen or so environmental activists were camped out to prevent construction of a Canadian pipeline to the North Dakota border, were awoken to the sound of howling shortly after midnight. A Sasquatch stumbled out of the woods into the edge of their camp, and with a huge arrow in its back, and they went to help it, and a giant wolf pitbull mix suddenly attacked a man, almost biting his arm off. A huge man appeared and ordered them to get back, followed by a bright light and a confusing eardrum bursting sound. And they woke up a few hours later to law enforcement and EMTs on the scene. Strange thing was, the man's arm was bandaged with a pressure dressing, and nobody there did it. About 2,200 hours, a group of men reportedly hunting werewolves in northern Wisconsin, near the upper Michigan Peninsula, made a free fall pit with a net. What could be described as a dogman came running out of the woods and fell into the pit. And as it tore at the net trying to free itself, a huge dog described as a giant wolf bulldog attacked the dogman. A couple of the men opened fire on both animals, and the dog turned on one, biting his thigh down to the bone. As a second man aimed at the dog, this huge man leapt about 15 feet from the bushes, slashing the men with a huge sword. He cut their rifles in half, leaving huge gashes on two of their arms and chests. A bright light and piercing sound came again, and the men woke up bandaged and with a local sheriff and EMTs tending to their wounds. They described the man's eyes as an almost transparent blue. Part 3 Gods and Chimeras Let's get straight into that. As Chuck and Harry were reading the reports, the sound of rotor blades was heard. Sergeant Jones shouted, Come see this! A new Sikorsky raider with coaxial rotors was landed on the helipad, and Ray Drake emerged from the chopper. We thought you were retired, said Chuck. Never, he replied. Let's get inside for a briefing. He told of how many years ago in the Middle East they had found some ancient Sumerian tombs. Some believed they had found the tombs of the Nimrod or Giglamesh. And DNA was extracted and a top secret program began where subjects were injected before they reached puberty. And what if I told you just one man could do what JTC Kill Team could do? Subjects Alpha 1 and Alpha 2 were injected with DNA from the specimen Alpha, or the more human-like one. Subjects X-Ray 1 and X-Ray 2 were injected with DNA from specimen X, the more animal-like one, to compare results between A1 and A2. The Alpha's aggression was controllable with medication, but the X-Rays seemed to be losing their minds. But just as with Achilles of old, rage took over for apparently mortal man was not meant for this. And Chuck angrily said, So, you have created more monsters and come to us to fix it? Indeed, gentlemen, you are the best, said Ray. Alpha 1 were accompany Hawk 2, the northern border, where X-Ray 2 was hunting for Dogman and Gugwe. Two hunters were killed at a British Columbia hunting camp just miles north of the Idaho-Washington state line, and three seriously injured. The report states that they fired at the large hybrid dog and huge man with disastrous results. Alpha 2 were accompanied Chuck to Sam Houston Forest where X-Ray 1 was hunting an aggressive Sasquatch clan. A Texas BFRO group was unfortunate to stumble into X-1's hunt. While one poor man was having his arms torn off by a huge angry Sasquatch, X-1 and his dog arrived. In the confusion, the BFRO reportedly fired at what they described as a hellhound, and it killed a man. Two more were seriously injured as they fired at a giant, and were shot with very large arrows. The mission is to locate, subdue, or eliminate X-1 and X-2. The Canadian Security Intelligence Service, or CSIS, requested we meet them at the border at an airstrip near the Patterson frontier to the north of Northport, Washington. Chuck's team will proceed to a rural airport near Sam Houston, 
you will divide your personnel and receive assistance from local officials. Hark will take one of my men and meet a Royal Canadian Mountie tracker. Chuck will also take one of my guys and meet with a park ranger and experienced pathfinder. Your C-130s and equipment are being prepped as we speak. Ray opened a side door and said, Gentlemen, please allow me to make a formal introduction. This is Alpha One, or Eric Sorensen. Six foot nine, three hundred and forty-five pounds, and this is Alpha Two, or Jamal Smith. Six foot ten, three hundred and thirty pounds. These men have enhanced vision, hearing, and eyesight, and they can run at speeds of about thirty plus miles an hour. They both have extremely high IQs, and with A1 being over one hundred and eighty. And needless to say, I just dropped at the sight of these men. Part 4. Myth ends where metamorphosis begins. Let's get straight into that. Just as Ray was about to leave, he shoved what looked like a rifle case at me and said, X1 and X2 have become quite the swordsman. You and Chuck may need these. And departed through the side door. We opened a case to find two of the blue swords like those we used against the reptilians in Japan. For a second time that day, my jaw dropped. By now, our team was beginning to file into the room as they stared in awe at our two new additions. And Chuck told them to take their seats and prepare to brief them. Listen up, folks. Take a few minutes to read the classified reports on your laptops. As Eric and Jamal quietly chatted with us, Chuck called the brief to order and shared what Ray Drake had just told us. Now allow me to introduce Eric Sorensen, or Alpha One, and Jamal Smith, Alpha Two. We will be dividing into two teams. One will go with Hawk to the Canadian border, and the other will accompany me to the Sam Houston National Forest. Our C-130s and equipment are being prepped. I will now turn over the briefing to Eric and Jamal. Listen carefully. They are going to describe what we are up against. Then both men made a whistling sound, whereafter the dogs ran in from the open side door. Our team members instinctively braced themselves as they were accustomed to when encountering huge wolf-like creatures. And Eric introduced himself and said, Please, meet Abashi, Abishe, named for the famous warrior of the Old Testament who killed 300 men with only a spear. He is well trained and well behaved. You can pet him without any fear. Just don't make any aggressive movements towards me. And those who will accompany us to the northern border will be hunting for Nikolai Ivanov, aka X ray 2. He's 7 foot 2 and 385 pounds. His father was Alexei Ivanov, a Ukrainian man and bodybuilder who underwent experiments being injected with gorilla DNA as a teenager. He became very violent, killing his wife and routinely beating Nikai. The program located and indoctrinated Nikolai when he was 11. X2, or Nikki, as we call him, is the largest and the strongest. He also has anger and aggression issues that medication has had little effect upon. He has removed his tracking chip along with one implanted in his dark Cerberus. He is arrogant and of an average intelligence, but relies mostly upon brute force. The four-foot recurved bow with a heavy titanium sword with a 36-inch blade. And just as all of us, he is issued with a Desert Eagle 50 cow and a Barrett 50 carbine. He has become out of control and deadly. Our mission is to locate, subdue, or eliminate. Now Jamal takes the floor and introduces himself. This is my dark Samson, and I'm sure you know who that is. As with Abishai, he is friendly unless someone makes an aggressive move towards me. We want you all to get acquainted with the dogs and let them get your sense. Our team will proceed to the Sam Houston National Forest, where my counterpart Jong Ping was hunting what is said to be the most aggressive Sasquatch clan in the country. Jong is known as X-Ray 1 and stands 7 foot tall, weighs 340 pounds. He is proficient with a bow and sword. His family hails from the Leoning province of China, known for extremely tall men. 
as a preteen, he had already become a problem for his parents and school. At age 12, he was sold to Arab slave traders and then purchased by the program. He has become careless, angry, and out of control. Hopefully, we can exploit his carelessness and use it to our advantage. And his dog Apollo was the hardest one from the litter to train. On the flight to our landing zones, we would get more acquainted and answer any questions within our authority to do so. Please use extreme caution on this mission. You have admirably dealt with cryptids, but now you are dealing with human intelligence combined with the abilities of a cryptid. These dogs are an Akita bull mastiff mix and were injected with the DNA of a canine-like animal found in the tombs. They can run at speeds close to 45 miles per hour, and their bite, huh, they can break bones. Part 5. A Journey into Destiny Let's get straight into that. Eric, Abishai, Hawk, Master Sergeant Tammy Martin, Staff Sergeant Bob Haynes, and six other team members loaded the C-130 with one of Drake's men named Zach Holt. Jamal, Samson, Chuck, Master Sergeant Bill Jones, Staff Sergeant James Rich, and seven more team members along with Drake's man, Clint Black, loaded into their C-130. During the trip, Tammy asked Eric to please tell them more about himself and how he got those bright blue eyes. And Eric spoke eloquently as he described his Viking lineage back to the 10th century. His father was six foot five weightlifter who won the World's Strongest Man contest. And due to his diet and too many steroids, his father died from a heart attack when Eric was only nine. The steroids had caused his dad to become abusive to his mother, and she had become depressed and turned to drugs and alcohol. When his father died, his mom was left with a huge debt and they lost their home. About a year later, she died from an overdose, and Eric went to live with relatives who considered him a burden. He got into trouble in school and wound up in juvenile detention. And that is when the program found him and brought him into the fold. The blue eyes are a side effect from the DNA. It is said that the Alpha and X-ray subjects were two-thirds divine beings. And he looked at Tammy and said, I suppose I am, but a Shakespearean tragedy come to life. Alas, my passion is philosophy, Greek mythology and reading the great authors of antiquity, he said. Well, Tammy seemed to be enthralled and fascinated with him, while the rest of Team Hawk made friends with the dog. When the crew chief shut the doors for Team Hawk's plane to depart at 0100 for the 2100 plus mile flight, and Corporal Kramer said to Tammy, Sarge, thought you might be wearing a skirt and heels. And everybody chuckled quietly at the interference to her infatuation with Eric but she scowled as the dog followed her as if he was her new protector. I wish I merely senses my concern for you, said Eric. But during the flight, Harry asked Eric how X2 got so big and what should they expect. Because Nicky's father received injections at such a young age, it had affected not only his DNA, but Nicky also. By the time Nicky received the DNA from Subject X, he already had transhuman genes and chromosomes. What are his weaknesses? said Harry. He is arrogant and condescending, and just as Icarus had wings and could fly, when he flew too close to the sun, his wings were burnt and he fell to the sea. He is full of hubris, and I contend he shall fall to his own demise. He relies too much on brute strength and too little on intellect. Eric told Harry that he had read every account and report on his missions. He looked at Harry and said, May I hold the famous Iorio Katana? And Harry extended it and Eric slowly unsheathed it and he responded with, I am truly in awe of this mythic blade that strikes fear into the serpent heart. Team Wolf's plane departed at 0500 for a 900 plus mile hop and everyone was getting acquainted with the dog and listening to Jamal tell his story. His father was six foot six a basketball player who got injured and lost his career and his wealth. He never really recovered from the disappointment and loss of his livelihood, 
he turned to drugs and spent his wealth on frivolous things and real estate ventures that bankrupted him and left him broke. His mum left his dad and became an exotic dancer who was killed by a violent sexual predator. And he went to live with an aunt who couldn't control him and got involved with a gang. And he wound up in trouble with the law and while awaiting trial, the program found him and gave him a new life. He was into reading science fiction and could recite lines from almost any sci-fi movie. His hobby was studying aerospace, but he was too big to be a pilot or an astronaut. Specialist slash combat medic Anne Nix was also intrigued with his eyes, and he told her about how it was a side effect from what some believe was Nephilim DNA. He then told them all that nobody should expect a kind demeanor from X1 or X2, for they are more primal. Science is about admitting what you don't know, and we just don't know how John will react to us trying to bring him in. And then there is the temperamental dog, Apollo, who is unpredictable. And Jamal went on to say that Jong Ping was immature and impatient, and too often acted with haste. He believed Jong could be provoked to excess anger and make a mistake. But under no circumstances should we underestimate his martial arts abilities, and extremely long arms and legs. He has fought well against the cryptids, but is untested against a proper human adversary. Part 6. Trial and Faith Let's get straight into that. As Team Wolf C-130 approached a small airfield near same Houston, the pilot came over to speaker telling everybody to buckle up for a bumpy short field landing. And Sergeant Bill Jones leaned over to Chuck and said, What are we messing with here? Isn't this against the laws of God and man? And Chuck responded, Bill, it's a mission like any other. Just stay grounded in your own faith. As the C-130 rolled to a stop, a white government F-250 truck flashed its lights and out walked for a service park ranger, Roger Grant. After a brief introduction, Chuck invited him onto the plane for a briefing. Grant rolled out a huge map of the forest and would have reported locations of Sasquatch activity and the sightings of Alpha 1 and Apollo as much as 30 miles apart in one day. Uh, how can this be possible? said Sergeant Rich to Jamal. Things are only impossible until they are not, said Jamal. Ranger Grant announced that Texas BFRO groups and some professional hunters are on the hunt for Jong Ping and the dock. They do not realize what they are up against, said Jamal. Grant said that park rangers and local law enforcement were out searching for people to evacuate them from the area and had found another BFRO member dead. It was not yet daylight and the team decided to prep their equipment and head out at first light. And a long flight to the Canadian border was coming to an end as the sun peaked above the horizon. The team had gotten some sleep on the overnight plane ride, but were ready to stretch their legs. They strapped in for a short field landing and were met by a black SUV. And out walked CIS agent Frank LaRue and Canadian Royal Mountie Bo Montgomery. And Harry shook hands and invited them onto the plane. LaRue displayed a map and shared real-time data about a sighting of Alpha 2 and Cerberus at a fishing camp just over an hour earlier. LaRue stated that Bo would accompany the team and he would head efforts to get the hunters, fishers and campers out of the area. The team would prep equipment and head out on ATVs until they reached the trail's end. The drone was to take off before sunset and Drake's men were armed with a portable ultrasonic weapon designed to disorient hearing, equilibrium and vision. Sergeant Tammy Martin pulled Hawk off to one side and said, Sir, I haven't been in the field since the new drones came online. May I go on the mission? What? Hawk responded. Briggs is certified to operate the drone and needs the experience, she stated. And Hawk hesitated and replied, Okay, uh, you just stay in the middle of the column and coordinate with Briggs. Yes, sir, she snapped. Eric spoke softly and said, But I fear these auburn locks are beacon like those which beguiled the fallen. Part 7. Tactics and Tragedies Let's get straight into that. 
And Chuck told Corporal Jones to have the drone on station before sunset, and Team Wolf began comms check with Vulture Base. Wolf 1, Vulture Base. Wolf 2, Vulture Base, and so on. Confirmed. Team to proceed on ATVs to trails, end, said Chuck. The crew chief and loadmaster stayed behind with an ATV to medivac any wounded. And after about two hours on foot, Jamal and Samson froze, with Jamal pointing to their 11 o'clock, where three BFRO members stumbled out of the woods, carrying one wounded. The leader explained that their camp was attacked by a Sasquatch clan, and before they could escape, two men were killed. As we were shooting at the Sasquatch, a huge dog jumped on one's back, and as it turned, I think a bullet hit it, and he thought that we were shooting at him. I had charged me before I could fire, and this big-ass arrow hit my thigh. Then two more arrows whizzed through the air, hitting one Sasquatch in the back, and the other in the eye. We turned our guns in that direction, and they were gone. A man in the tree stand fired and then screamed and fell to the ground with a huge arrow in his chest. Then this giant man runs in with a big sword and cuts the head off the surviving Sasquatch. Specialist and combat medic and Nicks tended to the man's wounds and Ranger Montgomery called for a standby medivac to meet them at the C-130. The team pushed on until late afternoon when Jamal abruptly said, Halt! A wounded Sasquatch stumbled out of the brush with an arrow in its lungs. The team went to alert with rifles pointed. Don't fire, said Jamal. This one is alone, and I smell that death will overtake him shortly. Jang is on the hunt, said Chuck. Yes, said Jamal. But this is a message for us to get out. Team Hawk comms check, said Harry. Condor base standing by. Hawk 1, Hawk 2, until our team members sound off and hear. Carnal base received. Roger that, said Harry. Have that drone up on top of us before sundown, and a medivac vehicle and crew ready. After a couple of hours on ATVs they stop as Abashi picks up a scent. The team proceeds on foot until early afternoon and discovers a neatly stacked pile of dead dogmen and a hunting camp in shambles. Well, how are we going to capture somebody who could do something like this? said Staff Sergeant Bob Haynes. Worry not, as Perseus and Pegasus, so have I, a Bishai, replied Eric. The team advanced another mile or so, and suddenly a log came flying, attached to a rope, and struck Private Davis, knocking him several feet through the air. Nicky had set a long trap meant for a gugway, but it had been tripped by a mere man with terrible results. Combat medic specialist Gerald Steiner checked the man's injuries and said, Not good, Hawk. He has internal bleeding and a severe concussion. The Hawk had no choice but to have two men carry him back to the ATVs for a medivac. The team was now three men down, pushed on until a Bishai bristled, and Eric put up his hand and all went to one knee. Suddenly, a wounded Gugwe rushed towards them and with its jaws gaping, before anyone could fire, Abishai clamped onto its leg and Eric leapt forward, severing its head with one clean swing of the massive sword. And he turned and said, This was Nicky's one, and only one into us, for he knows I am here. As Team Wolf plodded along, a hail of fist-sized rocks rained down upon them. John had made a catapult from a fishing net using it to pelt the team with baseball-sized rocks striking three people. One man had a serious head injury and would have to be medevaced. Jamal told the team to remain still because John knew he was here. But Drake's man Clint Black stood up and aimed the portable ultrasonic device in the direction the rocks had come from. John staggered through the bushes and with his hands over his ears and suddenly Apollo came soaring through the air and bit down on the back of Black's neck. The team fired on the dog as it runs off yelping, and Jamal fires a tranquilizer striking Jong in the leg. Jong was immediately able to pull it out and run for cover. And both the team member and Black were now out of play, along with two other team members who had to carry them to an extraction point. And Chuck asked Ranger Montgomery and Private Walker to carry the men out. The sun was now behind the trees, and when the comms crackled with, Wolf Actual! 
Vulture on station. We have heat signatures around your perimeter. Chuck had just lost four people and would now proceed with a team of seven to contend with his angry Sasquatch clan and to hunt down Jong Ping and Apollo. Part 8. A Clash of Titans. Let's get straight into that. Team Hawk moved cautiously as nightfall approached, and from an undetermined distance, a booming voice echoed through the forest. What is this sweet scent? Who is this woman? Nobody, said Eric. She has a free soul just as you, but you seek to forsake your first estate. Ah, she feels great affection for you, and you are entertained by her attention. I think I will have her. The only love you will ever have is that which you have for yourself. Well, Tammy is frozen in shock as Harry orders two men to flank her. Your hubris makes you akin to Sisyphus. Your ego is that rock you will forever be pushing up the mountain. And Nikki responds. Why do you continue to take orders from these lesser beings? What you call orders is what I call a choice. You and I kill different kinds of monsters. Belepharon was a slayer of monsters who slew many a chimera, not mortal man. Nicky fires an arrow at Eric and he twists and the arrow pierces his left bicep, taking out a chunk of flesh. Hawk fires full auto, striking Nicky in the thigh. Nikki fires an arrow, and Hawk veered as it narrowly missed. Tammy runs to Eric and applies pressure with a bandage. When Eric is kneeling and looks down at Tammy, it says, As Antony died in Cleopatra's arms, I shall not die in yours. They grab Tammy's arm as they move for cover, while Cerberus rushes towards them. And from the right, a flash collides with Cerberus as a Bashai attacks to defend them. Suddenly, the comms came alive from Vulture. Wolf one, heat signatures spotted. 80 yards, you're three o'clock. Appear to be shadowing you. Roger, stay on them. Deploy ordnance if they advance. High explosives and flares. Vulture, affirmative. The team continued slowly, following Jamal and Samson, when the comms crackled with, Wolf actual, this is Vulture. Target's moving on you. Stand by. The team halted and took a knee as they heard Vulture proclaim, a small object just flew through the air and struck one target. They scattered and two new signatures are flanking them. At that instant, the Sasquatch began throwing rocks at Team Wolf when a large boom was heard followed by a bang and a flash of light. The Chuck orders Vulture to repeat and scan for movement. The boom and the flash hit again, followed by a few moments of silence. Then came a loud voice saying, why do you serve these savages who inefficiently murder each other? And Jamal responded, Humans may kill each other, but they can distinguish the real enemy. Do you know the real enemy, brother? Vulture advises Chuck that four Sasquatch are down and three are retreating. And Jamal says, Show yourself, brother. We are here to take you home. And Jung replies, No. You are here to imprison me like a captive zoo animal. As Abashai and Cerberus rolled, snapping and clawing at each other, Condor came over comms with, Hawk actual, five targets approaching rapidly, nine o'clock. All appear to be tethered together. And Harry shouted, Engage! And the drone fired a volley of high explosives and flares that lit up the night. Three targets were down, but two dogmen erupted from the bushes. The team opened fire, dropping them as they rolled to a stop just feet away. But Nicky charged from the undergrowth with a sword held high. Eric rushed towards him, sword in hand, as sparks flew from the blades and steel as they collided. Eric moved more fluid and faster than Nicky, but Nicky's superior strength was proven a problem with Eric's injured arm. Nicky swung down violently with his sword using both hands, causing Eric's sword to fly out of his hands. Eric had left his tranquilizer gun with Tammy, and she fired at Nicky, striking his chest. But he immediately pulled it out. 
but at that moment Harry emerged from the right and swung his sword at Nicky, cutting his upper left arm. Nicky swirled with a counter-attack that Harry blocked, but Nicky executed a front kick so fast that Harry was unable to dodge and sending him about seven or eight feet through the air. Eric tackled Nicky and they rolled violently across the ground, fighting for control of the sword. Eric pushed his thumb into Nicky's injured arm, causing him to loosen his grip on the sword. And Nicky wrenched the sword away and emerged standing over Eric. And the team aimed their rifles at Nicky, and Eric shouted, Don't fire! Part 9 Brother versus Brother Let's get straight into that. John emerged from behind a tree, and Samson bristled as Apollo walked towards him with head down. Jamal walked towards John with a hand extended, and Apollo charged at him, and the dogs began to fight. Drake's man, Zack Walker, points the ultrasonic weapon at John and pulls the trigger, causing John to fall back onto the ground. He manages to pull his Desert Eagle and put a round into Walker's chest, sending him backwards onto the ground. Jamal, also aided by the ultrasonic weapon, leapt onto John as they fought for control of the pistol. They rolled and a pistol flew out as they both quickly came to their feet and with swords drawn. As they faced each other, Jamal said, there is a soothing wisdom from knowing you made the right choice. Make that choice now! And Chuck remembered Jamal saying that he was no match for John with a sword, and he shouted, Hold fire! and joined Jamal on pulling a blue sword. The sword seemed to reflect the light from John's eyes, causing him to freeze long enough for Jamal to attack. They had a momentary exchange, and John saw that Apollo was grievously injured from gunshots and Samson's attack. He ran to the dog to see him take his last breath, but he screamed in anger and faced Jamal. He looked confused as primal hate took over. Are you a hero or villain? What will you see when you look in the mirror? said Jamal. And he rushed Jamal in a rage with sword overhead. Jamal already had his desert eagle as he pointed and fired two times, and Jamal was destroyed and fell to his knees saying, the seeds of our destiny are nurtured by the roots of our past. I fear I have sealed my destiny by killing my brother. As Nicky was about to charge Eric, Hawk instantly threw his blue katana and it tumbled through the air as Nicky charged towards Eric. Eric took two lateral steps towards the trajectory of the sword and grabbed it. He swung with all of his strength at Nicky's oncoming sword blow, severing the blade. And Nicky paused, and for the first time, there was a look of fear on his face. And Eric calmly said, You never forget the face of the person who was your last hope. But he was silent, and Eric proclaimed, Take my help, brother. Live and make amends. And for a moment, Nicky looked calm. And then a huge smile came over his face, and he said, This is my choice, and my destiny, brother. Do not advance. He then reached for his Desert Eagle, causing both Tammy and Hawk to fire their forty-fives. Nicky staggered back, and before he could regain his balance, Eric slashed his neck, and blood spurted wildly. Nicky crumpled to the ground, and Eric knelt to hold Nicky's outstretched hand, and said, Brother, just as Narcissus fell in love with his own reflection in a pond, you were addicted to the love of yourself, and that hubris cost you your life. And after what felt like an eternity, but only about thirty seconds, Nicky took his last breath. And it was over, and both ex-subjects lay dead, along with their dogs. One of Hawk's team members was in critical condition, along with Drake's man Clint Black. And one of Chuck's men was seriously injured, along with Drake's man Zack Walker, who was lucky to have been wearing a bulletproof vest that prevented a 50 cal round from penetrating too deep. Both teams caught in medivacs for the wounded, along with the extraction teams for Nicky, John, and the dead cryptids. Eric walked up to Tammy and Harry, thanking them for the quick actions. And Harry excused himself and said he would let them talk. And Tommy asked, How are you feeling, Eric? 
And he replied, both sad but enriched for having shared time with you. She smiled and asked if she would ever see him again. And he paused and said, Unsure, but just as Eros kept his affection for Psyche as a secret, so must I for you. Tammy reached her hand behind his head and pulled his face down and gave him a kiss, saying, Oh yeah, who says? Part 10. Legacies and Beginnings. Let's get straight into that. The following day, at JTC headquarters, Raymond Drake met with Chuck, Hawk, Eric, and Jamal. Hawk, Chuck, you and your teams have served your country and your fellow man in a noble and admirable manner. Eric, Jamal, you have proven your potential. Gentlemen, you are looking at the future of cryptid intervention. Five or six member human teams working with an enhanced human and aerial support from even more advanced drones. Hawk and Chuck, I am sure that you both will want to retire into a not-so-distant future. You have set a standard for performance we will depend on you to train operators of the future. Eh, what about the ex-subjects? said Chuck. Will there be more experiments? More guinea pigs? No, said Drake. That part of the program is being terminated. Our future lies in the Alphas, he said. And will they be allowed to have real lives with family and freedom? asked Hawk. Absolutely, said Drake. Looks like you're Sergeant Martin is ready to test those waters herself, as he smiled at Eric. You know, said Jamal, we stared into the face of death, and death blinked first. You would think that that would make us feel brave and invincible. Eric looked at him with a sheepish smile, and said, How is it that you always seem to know the proper time to recite a line from a science fiction movie? And Jamal responded matter-of-factly, with a serious look. How is it that you do not? And we all burst into laughter. Epilogue And Zeus punished Prometheus for helping mankind. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What an intense and intriguing story. Something we come to expect now from Rico's stories. Setting the bar extremely high for others to follow. And to think you've only just begun writing. Really is quite remarkable, Rico. And I'm so glad you got in touch with myself to present your work here on the channel. Of course, I hope you enjoyed this rendition. And I cannot wait for any updates in the near future. Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Well, it really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now, if you think you got the minerals or would just like to have a crack of things like myself, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com And I really look forward to hearing from you. As ever, guys and girls, I hope you're all well and happy. Enjoying your week at work or school or studying, whatever it is that you do. And you're trying to stay fit and focused. But above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry.